it. All right, here we go. So that should still be up. Okay, nice. Ready for the week. Yes. Looking forward to it. Woohoo. <laughs> hey, hey. Forgive me, I'm at home. So, uh, yeah, you may hear some background sounds. All right, let's see. Cool beans. Now I will make an attempt to share that with you guys. Um, so you can see, and then I'm gonna kind of play around in here. Okay. I'm still here. You can hear my clock telling us what the hour is. Yay. Um, during the actual webinar, as we run through some things, I'll be clicking through a few um, tabs. I have some presentations up to help me go through some of the information. But during the actual webinar, when I get started, feel free to pop in a question in the Q&A that should be to your left. And I will be checking those intermittently as we go through. So we got about four more minutes. Hello and welcome. Uh, we're going to get started around 6.05, just to let our newcomers know. I wanted to give everybody a chance. I know there was some tech issues with logging in last week. And while we're sitting here, feel free to ask me if you came into one of the previous sessions and you have any questions from that previous session, definitely feel free to pop those in the Q&A as well. All right, we have two more minutes and then I'm gonna get started. One of these days, I'm gonna learn how to um, add some music to this so you guys aren't just sitting here and listening to me. Click around and breathe. <laughs> I'll figure this out one day. Baby steps, right? Okay, awesome. I have 605, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hello, my name is Kiana Brathwaite, and I am doing a webinar series. There's about four in the first section uh, that just gets people using their benefits. One thing that I've noticed is that uh, a lot of times folks don't know where to start, so I'm starting from 
just gathering your resources, getting to know where the stuff is, logging in. Um, oh, okay. I have a question. So I'll finish the beginning and then I'll, and I'll read the question and answer it. Um, so just getting started, right? That sometimes that first step is always the hardest step. So gathering your resources, figuring out how to log in, and then um, making sense of it all is the process that we're working through with the four different sessions. Um, those are the first two previous sessions. This, this, this session is actually going to answer a question that I get a lot, which is, um, why are my health insurance and why is my health insurance and my benefits so expensive and not so easy to use? So we'll jump into that, but I want to go ahead and answer this question. So um, one of the attendees has some tests done and they're waiting for results and they wanna know why the results take so long. So there's a couple of things that are going on. I'm not sure exactly what test. Um, so I'm gonna give a very broad answer to that question. Um, most of the time when you're going in, like if you go into an outpatient facility or you go into the hospital and you're using their laboratory facilities, there's kind of a hierarchy for when things get run and there's an expectation and a protocol set. Uh, and depending on the, um, uh, the severity or urgency of the test, uh, what's going on with the patient and what your patient status is can determine how long they're gonna, how long it's gonna take for those tests to come back. Also, it also depends on your doc. So if your doc sent the request in, the lab has to process them over a certain amount of time, and then they send the results to your provider so that your provider can take a look at them. And once your provider takes a look at them, then they release them to you. Um, they're finding that they don't necessarily want uh, patients to just blindly like to look at the labs and not know what they're reading or what any of the results mean. So they want to make sure that the providers are at least putting their eyes on the information before the patient's able to access it. So I hope that answered your question. I know that was kind of really broad, but um, that's usually what's going on. They, they've set that system up so that the provider is responsible for looking at those lab results before they release them to the patient. All right. So if I didn't answer your question, definitely, um, or there's more to that that you would like to add or ask, go ahead and pop that in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So one of the questions that I usually get a lot is, why does my health insurance cost so much? And I wanted to do two things today. Um, I wanted to, I'm going to start sharing my screen very shortly. I wanted to... Um, go over that first. So we're gonna take a quick look at some, and if you cannot see my screen, you should kind of see me waving at you. Um, and now I'm in a Google, um, I'm doing a Google search. So let's talk about this. If you can see this, I just Google, and how much does a CT scan? And that's a CAT scan. How much does a CT scan cost? And it gives you a nice little price range here because we are in a, shoppers or consumer society at this point, right? And I didn't do it with health insurance. I just wanted you guys to see raw numbers. So in New York, the average price is between $550 to $1,400. In Philly, it's $525 to $1,350. And then Atlanta, it's $550 to $1,400. And there's a couple more rows, but we'll go with this. And as you can see, there's there's a big um, expanse there, right? I mean, what what makes one place charge you 550 and another one charge you 1400? And that's one of the things that Congress is dealing with right now. That's something that um, the American Medical Association is dealing with right now is trying to create some level of standardization. The only way that's really controlled is by the insurance company saying, well, you may charge $1,400, but we're only going to reimburse you $600, right? Or we'll reimburse you $700. Um, and that is cross comparing pretty much any services provided within our healthcare system. And if you look across the country, 
that variation, that gap actually widens. So it could be in a rural area, you can go anywhere from, you know, a thousand dollars to five thousand dollars. Whereas if you have a, an urban area that has a lot of different health systems within the area, there that gap um, gets a little smaller. So that's why our health insurance, that's why our health care is so ex expensive because there's no real standardizations. And I could get on my soapbox about standardizations of um, pricing, but that's not what we're here to do. We're just here to ex understand kind of what is the lay of the land? What are you dealing with when you're going out there to interact with your health uh, systems, your health insurance, and the healthcare system as a whole? Uh, so this is just one of the ideas. And then if we do cost with uh, let's see, let's see, cost with ooh, Medicare. All right, we'll do cost with Medicare. <laughs> um, as you can see, there's a 20% Medicare approved cost for CAT scans and doctor's office visits. And uh, with part B, that deductible is 185. So Medicare, the CMS, um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do this in front of you guys. Cause I, the terminology CMS, um, here we go. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So CMS has done a really good job with starting that standardization. And a lot of insurance companies are reimbursing based upon the standards set by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So while I'm bouncing through here, I wanted to do a quick poll and ask those here. I'm going to do the first one. Um, the criteria you use to decide on the insurance coverage that you currently have. So if you can answer that for me really quickly, that would be awesome. And I'll tie that into what we're doing. So I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. And just asking, you know, was it the monthly premium? Was it out-of-pocket costs? Okay. We got one vote for out-of-pocket costs, deductibles, and co-pays. Um, sometimes people are taking into account whether their doctor is in network um, and the services that are provided by that health insurance. We got one, one or two votes here for, okay, so two votes for out of pocket and one for the monthly premium. Got you. So I'm going to talk to you about that really quickly. All of these things, except for closing your eyes and wishing for the best, <laughs> which is what some people do, right? Um, all of these things, your monthly premium, your maximum out-of-pocket costs, whether your physician, if you have a provider that you're seeing now, is in your network um, for the coverage that you're looking to receive, um, and then the services covered, all of that should be part of the plan. When you're going and you're looking at what it is that um, this is going to cost you, right, and how you're going to be able to use it, that's one of those ways where you can say, okay, I know that I've weighed out these four or five things um, and I know I can afford this premium. I know that um, the co-pays and the deductibles, I can, I can play around with that. And then you don't really necessarily, because you're thinking through the process and you're actively participating in the process and you're using how you would use your insurance as a gauge, then that helps you see your um, health insurance more as an asset and a resource than as this waste of money, okay? So keep those in mind when open enrollment comes back around. Um, I'll share one more poll with you in, in a little bit, but as you're, as open enrollment, and that should be something that you're kind of thinking of throughout the year, right? It's like, all right, am I using this health insurance? I'm paying for it. Next week when I talk about um, planning and, and really getting in and using it, I'll, I'll talk to you about um, how much we spent on health insurance last year and, you know, what that meant for us and um, how we felt about using it, where we using it. So we'll get into that. But definitely as you're going throughout the year and you have this coverage, you want to say to yourself, okay, am I, am I using this? Am I utilizing this? Does this feel like a waste? If it feels like a waste, why does it feel like a waste? And let me reevaluate how I'm using it. So I'm going to go back to, I wanted to check something really quickly. Um, so we'll do cost of hmm, mm, 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 emergency room. There we go. Now this actually talks about um, a typical copay, which is not necessarily, I would like to know more how much an emergency room visit costs. 
So, okay, here we go. Uninsured patients may pay between $150 and $3,000. And one reason why I am a proponent of insurance is because there's a contract that the providers have with the insurance that they're going to only charge a specific amount. So um, you're kind of getting, I don't like to let, use the word discount, but you are kind of getting a discount um, or you're getting what I call an incentive um, because you're in this whole group that's using this provider. So it's kind of incentivizing you to go to that provider or use that health system. And it's guaranteeing that uh, this is the amount that the max amount that you'll pay. OK, so um, again, as you can see, though, that's still a really big gap for people who are uninsured to have to make that decision whether or not they're going to go to the ER. Um, but I wanted to move into just how you can use. And last session I did talk about this, but how you can use I'm going to stop sharing really quickly because I have to come out and go into one of my presentations. Um, how you can use the. Summary of benefits, they call them um, summary of services, su summary of um, service benefits coverages. So how you can use those to um, gauge what, if, if you're getting the max out of your coverages that you, um, or your insurance that you're paying for. So I love these guys because I kind of feel like uh, and please, again, if you can't see my screen, let me know. I'll, I'll pop in real quick. I want to give you a minute to let me know if you can't see the screen. Um, but the two little chickies are kind of how I feel about <laughs> life and insurance, right? And and health and all that good stuff. It's like everybody's kind of doing their own thing. Sometimes folks are looking at you sideways. Sometimes you're looking at them sideways. But um, I'm going to open up here. And this is your summary of benefits and coverage, right? So each insurance company calls it something completely different. Um, they're trying to standardize, but I'm going to open this up so it's nice and big. And this is where that question gets answered for you. Why does my insurance cost so much? Or I feel like I'm paying so much for my insurance, right? When you get your insurance at the beginning of every year, I always recommend that you take a look at whatever they're calling it, brochure, um, um, package, uh, booklet, whatever. There's um, some insurance companies offer an interactive service or an interactive summary of benefits where you can go in and you can even kind of like Google search and go, you know, emergency room and see what comes up or you'll go, um, you know, doctor's visit and you can see what, what populates in the search for that particular interactive summary of benefits. But the way that I'd like to use this, and if you can see my mouse, is it breaks down for you, you know, what's your deductible? So what can you expect for you to pay as a deductible before your insurance kicks in um, at 100%? And here, and this is just one of the examples from uh, healthcare.gov that I was able to um, borrow. Thank you, healthcare.gov. Um, for participating providers and those are just in-network people and then or in-network providers, um, providers that have a contract with the insurance company. And then there's non-participating providers. And this is what you can, and those are the people who are outside of the actual network. They do not have a contract with the insurance company. And a lot of times in that instance, you'll have to pay and then be reimbursed. Um, so if you have, that's why I said one of the criteria that you should look for every year when you're if you're looking to upgrade, downgrade, stay the same, is just make sure that your providers are still accepting the insurance coverages that you have, because it can get pretty expensive, right? So for a single person um, who has insurance and their deductible is 15,000, that's a lot that you would have to, um, that, that's a lot of preventative, actually there should be some preventative in there, but that's a lot of visits <laughs> that you would have to, have before your insurance was really kicking in to help you offset whatever those out-of-pocket costs are. Um, and even at that point, when you switch into, okay, you've met your deductible and now the insurance is at 100% and I'm doing air quotes, sometimes that co-insurance kicks in, but that's a whole nother session because <laughs> that requires a lot of time and some explanations. But just know, you know, this is where you would go to look at, all right, what are my out-of-pocket costs? Um, what kind of 
co-payments and co-insurance, as I said, um, the co-payment is what you're responsible for paying the provider, right? What was contracted um, and agreed upon that would be your immediate out-of-pocket cost when you're going to the provider. And then the co-insurance really kicks in with what are you carrying? What weight or how are you coming to the table and meeting your insurance company? So yes, you're paying the premium. Yes, you're paying the copay. But you're also responsible for a portion of whatever that contracted amount was that was agreed upon by the insurance company and the provider. So that's where the coinsurance comes from. Um, and then it talks about, you know, your out of pocket limits. So these are the numbers that you hopefully you'll have access to um, before you're able to choose or you have to choose your plan. And then other times, this is the stuff that you need to kind of really get into because this is what's going to tell you when you go to the doctor or you go to the ER or you go to a nutritionist or you go to um, anybody that is within the healthcare system and they are providers who are recognized by insurance companies and health entities. Um, anytime you go to them, instead of holding your breath and hoping that, okay, this bill is going to come in or this bill isn't going to come in or I'm not going to be able to afford whatever this service is that I need, this gives you a really good idea of what that will look like so you're not you know, freaking out or you don't not go. I mean, it's better to be informed and say, okay, I got $7,900 that I'm responsible for. That's going to affect how I'm making decisions about when I go see somebody, but I'm actually at least still knowledgeable, informed, and aware that I'm going to be responsible for that. How, I, how you choose to use that information is entirely up to you, but it's better to have it than to not to know it. Um, so the next one gives you a nice little breakdown of you know, if you visit your healthcare provider's office, what, what it will cost, you know, and they should give you an idea of what they consider specialist. Um, and then they would also tell you what services, like how much it's going to cost. As you can see with this example, an in-network provider is $50. So that's a $50 copay um, and their deductible does not apply. So what that means, I, I did mention in a previous session, there is a move for preventative care. So a lot of insurance carriers are saying, you know, if you do these preventative things, then um, we'll all, you know, you won't have a deductible. You, I'm sorry, it doesn't go against your deductible and you won't necessarily have a copay. Now, when they're saying that the deductible doesn't apply here, that really means for the copay, if you're paying out of pocket for that premium, that does not go towards your deductible. All right. That is just that is an additional cost that's coming out of your pocket that you're responsible for. Um, and they don't count that towards your deductible. Now, if it was you went in, you paid the fifty dollars, the primary care physician charged two hundred and seventy five. You paid um, fifty. So that's two twenty five. And then the insurance said, well, for a two hundred seventy five five dollar visit we'll pay eighty five dollars and then you have to pay the remaining amount then that remaining amount is what will be credited towards removing some of your deductible okay so that's how that works the out of network provider your co-insurance kicks in and that means that you'll pay whatever they're billed right so whatever they bill whatever your provider bills the insurance you pay 50% of that, and then the insurance will pay the other 50%. But um, I think in some, in most instances, that that is a reimbursement. So if the bill is two, let's go back to the 275. I'm going to use my calculator. Yes, I'm cheating, but um, it's just a little easier for me, and I want to make sure I'm given correct numbers. So you'll pay the 275, right? And then the whole 275, and then the insurance will reimburse you through setting, going through the reimbursement process. You have to fill out forms. Sometimes they do it online. They will reimburse you $137.50. So you have to make sure that you have that 275, and then it's this, I'll say a 60 to 90 day process to be reimbursed. And those are the quicker ones that get the stuff out. Um, sometimes you can play, I didn't get the check. 
because uh, we've had that before um, where it's like, you know, I sent this in, I did what I was supposed to do and you guys didn't mail me, but you're telling me you did. So sometimes you have to play that. But I'd say it's at least a three month turnover for you to get your reimbursement if you're using an out of network provider. Um, then we go into preventative care, right? So I was talking about this a little while ago that there's a move for preventative care it is more cost effective for the insurance companies because if they can pick up something sooner, it's going to cost them less to get you well or get you back to your baseline. Um, and the they they try to incentivize you to do the preventative care by not charging you a copay. So there's no copay. Right. And then um, it doesn't apply to it doesn't go towards your deductible, unfortunately, but there's no copay for it. Um, and I have seen with clients that a lot of times um, there is a good amount of that charge that is covered by your insurance because they want to incentivize you. So as you can see, like, um, for instance, they have colorectal cancer, cancer screenings. Your cost would be seven hundred and fifty. Uh, but if this is a non preventative with the provider, you may have to pay for services that aren't preventative. So there's a great resource and I can, um, um, healthcare.gov actually provides this resource to people so that they can look to see what information, what services are covered. Cause they're kind of guiding that now um, with saying, all right, well, these are the services that we feel are preventative. It's kind of like CMS where they're saying, you know, we're gonna provide a list. These are the services that are covered and that are considered preventative. And, um, you know, you can use that list if you go to a doctor and you do one of those services or you have one of those services, you can go and look at that list. And, and if you have to pay for it, that's a great way for you to have a conversation with your insurance company. Like this is a preventative service. I don't understand why I'm paying for this. Um, and it's also a great way for you to have a conversation with your physician's office. Cause I've had, I went in for my um, annual for my OBGYN last year and they charged me a copay and I should have known better, but you know, you forget things. Um, so I actually went and looked for something for a client and was like, wait a minute, that was a preventative service. So I called and they actually cut me a check and I didn't have to fight them. Um, but sometimes you will have to kind of box and make a bunch of phone calls and talk to a manager, but at least you'll be informed. You'll have that information and you can show, all right, well, this should be a preventative service. Um, so I am going to pause here and give an opportunity because that was a lot of information. Give an opportunity for any questions that you may have. Um, it's about 627. I usually finish up around 630. So, but I'll give us a couple minutes if you want to ponder. And I think I had a poll that I wanted to ask. Um, ah, so at the end of this, now that we've gone over this information, while you're kind of thinking about any questions you may have, I'll also share this poll. So do you feel now that you have gone through kind of what things cost, why there's such a big gap in disparity and how you can um, use the resources that your insurance company provides you to figure out costs. Do you now feel that you pay too much for your health insurance? I would love to get your input and feedback on that. So I just popped up a poll there. I still have one. Yes. OK. <laughs> All right. I have one. Yes. One. No. And then I have not sure. It depends. All right. Cool. That's I, I could have done that, you know, flip that and, and seen where um, I would love to know whoever said yes. And we could take this offline if you want. Um, I would love to know what knowing that there's such a disparity um is it was is it because of the disparity that you feel that you still pay too much for health insurance um or you know is there something else that I can help explain and and kind of point you in the right direction with another resource so you can definitely I'll make sure that I um include my email address so I'll do that now if you want to take anything offline um here's my email address And please feel free to text me as well. All right, and there they are if you have any questions. 
and I will give us, I'll give us another, I'll sit here for another 10 minutes or so if you want to just pop any questions in there. Otherwise, you know, um, as I said, I'll stop sharing too. At 630, you're more than welcome to go. I know it's Sunday. We're getting ready for the week. Um, Tomorrow's Monday. Yay. Uh, (laughs) So if you have to go, that's fine. Uh, I will make sure that I do send you guys this recording as well. So you can go back over that information. I know it was a lot and I did kind of run through it a little quickly. Um, I just want to be mindful, like I said, of everybody's time. So you'll have, you'll get the recording. So thank you for attending. You'll get the recording. And then in the recording, I'll provide you in that email. I provide you a um, link where you can schedule specifically to discuss any webinar questions, uh, related questions that you may have. Awesome. Awesome. Nice. Finish the 630. Woohoo. I like being on time. Are most preventative visits free? That is a great question. Yes. Um, As I said, the insurance. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, The insurance companies are really trying to. hmm, I'm trying to put this. They want to save money. Right. So before they were moving, it was just a acute situation. So if you had something acute you came into the system, but now they want to actually um, not just go with the acute, or if you had something that was urgent, it's like that was the only time that you interacted with the healthcare system. Um, Now they wanna actually get you to seeing your providers on a regular basis. They wanna get you, you know, get a baseline as to where are your blood sugars? Where's your blood pressure? You know, for men, it's, you know, where's your PSA, which is the marker that they use to look at their prostate health, right? Um, where's your weight? Is there is there something that we can do to help you improve your lifestyle? And you'll have some of these insurance companies that offer incentives for the checkups and they offer incentives for, you know, the number of steps that you do um, in a month, a week or whatever. And you'll, you'll get a $50 gift card for things. So the, along with the preventative visits and, and free is, I'm, I'm doing the air quote. So free would be more so you're, you don't have a copay, right? There's no copay responsibility, but there may still be um, something as far as your either your deductible, because as you saw with the summary of benefits, the preventative services don't necessarily count towards your deductible. So they may, may be offset there or your coinsurance, because even when you meet your deductible and you before it used to be when your insurance was 100 percent, it was 100 percent. And now there's just so many facets to that. But your co-insurance may kick in and you still may have to pay, you know, 80, 20, 60, 40. But the upfront, as soon as I go into the doctor's office, that cost right there, usually that is pretty much waived. So you wouldn't have the copay, the immediate out of pocket cost. Um, any other questions? That was an awesome question. And that word free is, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that word free, I don't know if there's anything really free anymore. <laughs> they usually tack on something at the back end, but yeah. Um, no upfront out of pocket costs is what I usually like to tell my clients. <laughs> so you're not, you know, you know what to expect. All right. And did everybody get the um, email? If you did not, just let me know it didn't come through because I have your email address and I can I can send my information to you. Okay, awesome. I have a yes. Cool. Um, While everybody's thinking next week. We will be doing this. I'll, do, I'll be doing the fourth of the th- the one of the installments for this session. Um, just getting up, you know, just getting started um, is pretty much the theme for this one. And it is always helpful. So the homework for the first two sessions was to log into your portal so that you could go in and have any questions and I can answer those questions. You know, we could possibly share screens or what have you. Um, 
Oh, yes, the terminology update. You're welcome. Um, uh, next week we'll be talking about, so we're going, we've gone into our resources, we've logged into our portal, hopefully wink, wink. And now we've, we've looked at the summary of benefits. We have a better understanding of what, what, what things cost, why they cost, what they cost, and then what our coverages are. Um, next week, I'll actually start the planning process, right? So it's kind of building on all of the other foundational things. And we'll start talking about you know, looking for a provider. Um, let, as in one of the sessions, I noticed when I went through that we had nutrition benefits. So we got to see the nutritionist about six times a year, no cost to us. And um, that benefit has actually, they didn't um, re-up that benefit for 2020. So I want to go in and actually just start planning, right? So I'll take the, and I'll share my screen one more time, just so you can kind of have an idea of something to look forward to. Um, I'll take the summary of benefits like we have here. And I'm going to open this up a little bit and I'll say, okay, so let's take, for instance, we have a deductible, right? We have a deductible. We'll use the we'll use the um, individual, which would be fifty five hundred dollars. How do we plan to meet that deductible? What would that look like, right? And then I'll go through. We'll take a look at what um, the healthcare.gov site recommends as preventative care and start that process to begin to really understand. Okay, this is my deductible. This is what my copay is going to look like. How do I plan that out? Can I schedule, you know, my my primary care in March, and then I know that that's going to be thirty five dollars and two hundred and fifty dollars. So I'm looking at three hundred dollars, and only the two fifty goes towards my fifty five hundred deductible. Now I know that I've reduced that a little bit. So my next step, depending on your health status or what you're trying to do, maintain or improve your health, you know, really walk you through that process of how to plan that out, what that could look like. So that's my plan for what we're going to work on and what we're going to do next week. So it would be really awesome if you guys came um, to the, and I know we are all crazy busy and I, I don't, I don't want you to write it out or anything, just have an idea so I can do some case studies and really help you figure this out. So you'll have some notes and you can have a plan in place once you're done, um, how you're going to meet the deductible, how you're going to be able to afford to take care of your health, you know, um, those kinds of things uh, so that you're, you, you have a plan. And, and if you have a plan, you're, you're in a better position. Um, and if you have an understanding, you're definitely in a better uh, position as well. All right. So it was wonderful, wonderful having everybody. Oh, for most providers, can you only sign up once a year? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm not assuming, but when it comes to providers, and it depends. So with a PPO, which is um, a personal choice, and you kind of you don't need referrals when you go see a provider. Great, yes, awesome. You take care. Have a great week. Um, but to answer your question, for PPOs, you can change providers all throughout the year, right? With HMOs, um, you have to designate, especially a primary because that primary is going to be the one that is road mapping your care, right? So you'll have to go to the primary to get a referral to then go to a specialist. With the PPO, you can go to your primary or you can go to the specialist. Oh, I'm having stomach issues. I'm a Google something. Stomach issues are covered by a, oh, gastroenterologist. Okay. I'm going to make an appointment with a gastroenterologist, right? I don't need to go to my primary if I have a PPO. If you have an HMO, you do need to go to your primary. You're going to have to have a conversation and they can refer you to somebody. Okay. Now, I, being a healthcare uh, professional, um, being somebody who does really good research and have different criteria for what I'm looking for in a provider, um, I don't necessarily accept or use the referrals by my um, doctors, or if I do, they are one of the people who I put on my list as I do my research. They are not my go-tos, but a lot of times with HMOs, they have to be your go-tos. And most um, Medicaid and Medicare insurance providers, they are HMOs. So you do have to, um, and you can change a provider throughout the year, but you have to physically call the HMO and say, 
I'm no longer seeing Dr. Johnson. I'm now going to see Dr. Jones. And then you have to kind of wait for that to get into the system. And then you can go see Dr. Jones. That's the other reason why I have a preference for PPOs. But I know not all employers go down that road and offer PPOs. Um, so you can change your provider as often as you need to. If you're having an issue with a provider, I always recommend change. Well, pause. I'm sorry. If you're having an issue with a provider, I would like to have a conversation with you about that issue because sometimes if you make your provider aware of the issue that you're having, depending on what kind of person they are and uh, how they perceive their interaction with their patients, making them aware, may you guys may be able to have a conversation about expectations. Um, if you just say, oh, this person sucks and I'm going to leave, you haven't really given them an opportunity to provide you with the care that you're looking for. So I like to answer those. I like to kind of delve a little more deeper before I say just leave them. But if you're having horrible experiences with them and their office staff, especially their office staff, I've left providers because I love the provider, but their office staff just couldn't get it together. And those were the frontline people. And I had to deal with them all the time. And I was just too frustrated and stressed out. So I was like, all right, deuces, I'm gonna go look for somebody else. <laughs> Um, I hope that answered your question about the once a year. And it is 640. Oh, my gosh. I'm not going to hold you guys any longer. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful week. I look forward to seeing you guys next week. I'll send out the recording. If you have any questions, you have my email. You can definitely text me and I will get back to you. All right. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate everything. You guys were awesome. Great. I'm glad I answered your question. Take care. I'll see you next week. Bye.